the most mysterious character in American literature may well be a great white whale. It represents what is at once beautiful, terrifying, and incomprehensible in the universe. The story of an obsessed captain and his quest to hunt down and kill the great white whale has become part of our American consciousness, retold in everything from comic books to Hollywood movies. It's a tall tale about the pursuit into the unknown, the struggle between reason and madness, good and evil. It's a novel filled with metaphors and symbols, and the biggest one of all is the great white whale. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Call me Ishmael. Perhaps the most well-known opening line in American literature. Moby Dick is an American masterpiece. For many, the greatest book ever written on American soil. Each culture, I think, has its extraordinary high points. And certainly, Melville's Moby Dick ranks as one of the high points of human creativity, as some of the symphonies of Beethoven do, as the Sistine Chapel does, as the pyramids do. These are things about which there is no argument insofar as their greatness is concerned. We, we can't say Moby Dick represents good or evil. That's too small. He represents the cosmos, the, the complete thing of creation. Whatever name you want to put on, if you want to say the creator, if you want to say God, if you want to say the cosmos, the universe, he represents that. And that totality is incomprehensible. And that's why he will remain a fascinating symbol and metaphor to the end of time. Ishmael, the narrator of Moby Dick, says to produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. In 1850, when Herman Melville began to write his novel, he decided to touch upon them all. Race, democracy, sexuality, and the existence of God. It's a strange book, and it's compelling because that strangeness gets you where it hurts. It gets you in places that you don't want to talk about very much, and yet you need to confront them. It's about your identity, who you are, what you are, and why you are. It's a complex novel that can be interpreted on many different levels. On the surface, the story is simple. Ahab, the captain of the whaling ship Pequod, on a previous voyage, lost his leg to the great white whale, Moby Dick. Now he wants revenge. Ahab is determined to hunt down and kill Moby Dick. In the Bible, Ahab is a wicked king who goes against God's will. In Melville's book, Captain Ahab goes against the white whale. 
which may be a symbol of God, or the devil, or simply all that thwarts human intentions. Millions of people who have never read Moby Dick know the story through the 1956 movie by film director John Huston, starring Gregory Peck. Novelist Ray Bradbury wrote the screenplay. Well, it was a very difficult task. It went on for months and months of my reading and rereading of Melville, and at times I was in tears. I just felt so stupid. And uh, Houston wasn't that much help. I discovered he, he loved the book too, but he couldn't help analyze it. And finally, after six months of reading and rereading the book, out of, I got out of bed one morning in, in London, looked in the mirror and said, I am Herman Melville. And I ran to the typewriter in a frenzy, uh, hyperventilating, and I sat there for eight hours and I wrote the last 40 pages of the screenplay in one day emotionally being Melville for the first time in all those months. And I ran across London and I threw the script on Houston's lap and I said, there, I think we finally got it. And he read it and he says, yes, we're ready to begin. All you masked hitters, now hear me. You're to look for the white whale. Ahab sees Moby Dick as evil incarnate, and in his attempt to conquer evil, Ahab tragically becomes evil himself, becomes a dictator, a tyrant, almost a Hitlerian character. I was Moby Dick that tore my soul and body until they bled into each other. I'll follow him around the Horn and around the Norway Maelstrom and around Perdition's Flames before I give him up. The story of Moby Dick is not only a story of a chase and revenge, that's too simple, but it's the story of each of us if we're not careful. We want answers to everything. We want answers to the creation of the universe. We can't have them. We will never have them. Now, if you keep hammering at that door, the door of uh, the universe, the door of death, the door of life, eventually you'll go crazy. Ahab never had enough sense to give up the asking and get on with his life. The book begins with the young Ishmael longing to go to sea. Years later, he is looking back telling the story of his adventures as a seaman on the Pequod. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself pausing involuntarily before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. Ishmael is also a biblical name meaning outcast or wanderer. Melville is creating this character Ishmael to be his, uh, in a way, his central character. A character who's been through a lot, uh, both uh, mentally and spiritually, and also physically. He's gone out on this whaling venture, and it has scared him to death. And he is now coming back, he's ready to write, and he begins. And what he is seeking is a kind of companionship with you, the reader, and a larger companionship with the rest of the world. Before shipping off to sea, Ishmael spends the night at a crowded inn. Unexpectedly, Ishmael has to share a bed with Quiquake, a Polynesian cannibal who is covered with tattoos. Quiquake, when he first meets Ishmael, appears out of the night. He carries dried heads. He is holding a gigantic harpoon. He's terrifying to the young Ishmael.
What's all this fuss I have been making about, thought I to myself. The man's a human being, just as I am. He has just as much reason to fear me as I have to be afraid of him. Best sleep was sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Turned in, and never slept better in my life. Upon waking next morning of daylight, I found Quagsum thrown to me a most loving and affectionate man. You almost thought I'd been his wife. Today, readers may assume there is a homoerotic relationship between Queequeg and Ishmael. Each new generation interprets Moby Dick's themes in different ways. Queequeg does become a bosom friend to Ishmael, but whether or not there is a homosexual relationship is not clear. Ishmael is learning more about himself. He's breaking down those traditional patterns of what it means to be rigidly male as opposed to rigidly female. And with, with Queequeg, he is blending these male and female attributes in a very creative way, in a very um, sensual way, in a very sensitive way. Ishmael and Queequeg are hired as crew members on the whaling ship Pequod. On a cold and misty Christmas day, the Pequod slips out of Nantucket, headed for the South Pacific. At last the anchor was up, the sails were set, and off we glided. It was a short, cold Christmas, and as the short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost broad upon the wintry ocean, whose freezing spray cased us in ice as in polished armor. And like the white ivory tusks of some huge elephant, vast curving icicles depended from the bows. The crew does not see Captain Ahab for several days. They only hear the sound of his ivory leg as he paces the deck at night. His steady ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he paced his old rounds upon planks so familiar to his tread, that they were all over dented like geological stones with the peculiar mark of his walk, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever pacing thought. Ahab's only thought is to find and kill Moby Dick. The first mate, Starbuck, has gone to sea simply to hunt whales. You're not game for Moby Dick? Captain Ahab, I am game for any kind of death if it comes in the way of the business we follow. That they know. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. Starbuck represents the way we should all behave. In other words, you've got a family, you have a wife and children at home who have a job to do. For God's sake, do it. Don't try to solve the mysteries of the universe. That way, as is proven in the actions of the, of the novel, lies madness. So Starbuck is sanity. Cheer up, my life, and that's quite a story Cheer up, my life, Starbuck and his crew do their job. Sperm whales are harpooned and killed for their oil. At the same time, Captain Ahab hears from other whaling ships of several sightings of a great white whale. He grows more agitated, eager to find his white demon. From the beginning, uh, lovers of Melville have loved not just the excitement of the stories, but the language, and have recognized in Moby Dick a richness of language that is Shakespearean. Words and phrases and sentences and paragraphs for Melville were sinews and tissues and bones and ligaments and joints. Um, a book was a living organism for him. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. By reasons of these things then, the whaling voyage was welcome. The great floodgates of the wonder world swung open, and in the wild conceits that swayed me to my purpose, two and two there floated into my inmost soul, endless processions of the whale, and midmost of them all 
one grand hooded phantom like a snow hill in the air. It's metaphors, the gift of metaphors, speaking in tongues, uh, the influence of Shakespeare, the influence of, of the Old Testament. These are the midwives of Moby Dick. And when you have that many metaphors lined up, hundreds of them, and dozens of major ones, that is the thing that drives uh, the novel. The white whale represents different things to each character in the novel. To Captain Ahab, he represents all that is evil in the universe. To Starbuck, he's just an animal to be killed for oil. To Ishmael, he is nature in all its wonder, beautiful yet terrifying. In Ishmael's words, the ungraspable phantom of life. And as the ungraspable phantom of life, Moby Dick is possibly uh, representative of evil, but Moby Dick is associated with beauty, uh, with possibilities, with infinite uh, resources, uh, all the kinds of things that we associate when we look at the sky or when we look at the ocean. When we look at the entire natural world and we think about all of the possibilities that are open to us as human beings. Farewell and adieu to you Spanish ladies, farewell and adieu, you ladies of Spain, our captains commanded to sail for New England. We hope In the 1840s, Melville's New England was at the height of the whaling era. The United States dominated the whaling trade, supplying the world with oil for its lanterns, street lamps, and all kinds of machinery. The whaling industry in New England, from about the beginning of the 19th century, just up until about 1850, when Melville wrote Moby Dick, was a major industry in New England. It made fortunes. When Melville wrote Moby Dick, New Bedford was the richest town in the United States. Petroleum wasn't discovered until 1859. Whale oil was the oil of commerce. A whale ship in the 19th century was very much like an oil tanker of today, except that the oil it was carrying came out of a living animal rather than out of the ground. There were plenty of available jobs on whaling ships, and before the mast, only skill counted. Men of all nations, including free blacks and Native Americans, were welcomed on the whalers. But the work was dirty and underpaid. Sometimes men were even shanghaied into joining the ship's crew. Somebody might slip drugs into their drink while they were drinking at a tavern or a bar, and they'd wake up on a whale ship, or somebody might just hit them over the head and they'd wake up on a whale ship. Although whaling ships were well equipped, provisions were limited. Life was not easy on board. Water and salt beef frequently turned bad. There was little ventilation, light, or privacy for the men who shared the cramped quarters. It was like working in the coal mines. Um, it was definitely the bottom of the maritime trades. You didn't want to be a whaleman or a blubber hunter, as they were sometimes called. In the midst of harvesting sperm whales, the Pequod meets another whaling ship that has heard of Moby Dick. Ahab is convinced the whale is near. He sets sail and heads directly into the eye of a storm. Captain Ahab, think what they're doing, I beg thee, think. Set the mainsail! No, sir, no. Mr. Starbuck, are you opposing me? If so, I'll have you know that there's one God that is Lord over the earth and one Captain over the Pequod. 
The storm turns into a typhoon. Ahab refuses to reduce sail. The men panic. But Ahab's grim determination forces them back to their posts. And his leadership guides them safely through the storm. As the voyage continues, Ahab becomes increasingly monomaniacal in his vengeful quest to kill Moby Dick. Among the crew, only the first mate, Starbuck, has the courage to challenge Ahab. To be enraged with a dumb brute that acted out of blind instinct is blasphemous. Speak not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. We have the good man who is up against the dictator. And it is in the character of Starbuck that I believe Melville challenges most of his readers. He challenges us to try to figure out how to deal with controlling ideologies. He challenges us to try to deal with political tyrants. And he suggests to us why we fail in, uh, in coming up against political systems that are bigger than ourselves. We've gone through Mao Zedong, who killed a lot of his own people. We, went, we came through Stalin, who killed his own people. We came through Hitler, who killed as many Jews as he possibly could. Uh, the, there's been evil all around us, and in the middle of this are trying to make do, trying to make some good in the world, to bring some sense of it, to bind our family together, to, to tend to our friends. So Moby Dick, I think, will be around forever because it poses the problem of evil and why it should exist, and what we can try to do about it, and fight it as best as we can. Melville created a cosmic allegory out of the unglamorous whaling industry. For Melville, the ship became a setting, a canvas upon which the great mysteries of the world could be unraveled. It was here, overlooking the harbor in New York City, that Herman Melville was born in 1819. Oh, I think the love of the sea is uh, something that was, was in his veins. I think salt water was in his veins from the, his earliest days. He was born on the tip of Manhattan Island where ocean-going ships by the hundreds um, came sailing in and out of Manhattan, out of New York Harbor. It, mu it must have been gorgeous. He lived an idyllic childhood until the age of 11 when his father fell deeply in debt and then suddenly died a year later. From that time on, he felt an outcast of the universe. The family had no position, no standing, they were poor relations. He seems to me to have been a child who was an observer, who sort of stood on the sidelines, who could see himself both as subject and object in a sense. Perhaps that's what prepares people to be writers and artists. When Herman was 21, he did what many young men did at the time. He set sail for the South Pacific. In the early 19th century, the South Pacific was a counterpart to the American West, a vast, uncharted expanse, harboring untold danger, beauty, and adventure. After 18 months at sea, Melville and a friend decided to jump ship on the Marquesas Islands. There he stayed for a month and lived with people who were thought to be cannibals. Sexual barriers were down, um, dress, uh, androgynous dress and not in dress, uh, feathers, men wearing feathers, earrings, etc. He had an enormous, wonderful shock. And within himself, he recognized that there were many selves and many forms of consciousness. Melville wrote, 
A whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. It was during these years that Melville became convinced that racial tolerance and respect for other human beings were essential ingredients of a civilized society. His experience at, on, on whaling ships and his experience in the South Seas is his direct experience of colonialism and imperialism as a young man, I think, was really a catalyst to, uh, to seeing things differently, to seeing the, uh, the ironies and the broken promises and uh, the nightmare side of the American dream. After four years at sea, Melville returned to New York City from the South Pacific and began to write of his adventures among the islanders. At the age of 25, he had found his true calling as a writer. His first two books, Taipei and Omu, were instant successes and made him an overnight literary sensation. Melville soon found himself famous as the man who had lived among the cannibals. A lot of people just loved the sensuality of the descriptions of the South Seas. The, the Times of London said, what a happy dog, happy Herman, happy dog. And, and it was obviously, the, the, the reviewer was reveling in the idea that Herman was having uh, uninhibited sexual experiences all over the South Seas. Melville was the first American literary sex symbol. By age 30, Melville had written five books. Now he was ready to begin writing Moby Dick, a book that would change his life. Halfway through writing Moby Dick, Melville met Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hawthorne was an established writer who understood the depth of what Melville was trying to achieve. The friendship affected Melville profoundly. The relationship between Melville and Hawthorne is one of the great stories in American literature. Melville's letters to Hawthorne are very intense. Uh, he's finally, it seems to me, found the one artist, one other artist who can understand him and who can fee give him feedback on his writing. And, and this was a very joyous and intense uh, moment. He wrote, If ever, my dear Hawthorne, in the eternal times that are to come, you and I shall sit down in paradise in some little shady corner by ourselves, and if we shall by any means be able to smuggle a basket of champagne. The latest tendency is to talk about it as a homosexual relationship and to have sort of brought Melville out of the closet in some way. And I'm not going to gainsay that because. I don't know. I, I think that, that language, the language that we use to talk about relationships between pe friends of the same sex, passionate friendships in the 19th century, is really anachronistic. Herman admired the genius of Nathaniel Hawthorne and discovered in him a kindred soul who could appreciate what he was trying to write. When Melville finished writing Moby Dick, he dedicated it to his beloved friend. Nathaniel Hawthorne. Melville sat down to write Moby Dick in 1850. He felt America was slipping away from the ideals of its founding fathers. It was a time of unprecedented change. The Industrial Revolution was transforming the American landscape. Gold had been discovered in California and people were moving west. The Civil War was 11 years away and slavery was dividing the country. Melville explored these different themes in Moby Dick. On board ship, there were four harpooners, each representing a different culture, a different race. Melville, in writing Moby Dick, was concerned to bring together 
all of the races, all of the ethnic groups of the world. Thus the Pequod, as a ship, becomes a symbol for the ship of state, becomes almost like a little democracy. As the voyage continues, Moby Dick remains elusive. Ahab encounters the whaling ship Rachel, whose captain lost his son to Moby Dick only the day before. He pleads with Ahab to help him find the boy. Ahab refuses. Captain Ahab, answer me! Captain Gardner, I seek the white whale! With Ahab, you have a classic male pattern anger. Here's an individual who is just white hot mad. Not so much that his leg has been chewed off by this big white whale, but that there is a pattern to the universe that is against man, that is against him, that belittles man and bel belittles his intellect and belittles his spirit. And what he wants to do in order to claim some sort of dominance over this is to strike back to, to hit back at God. And so he has this fist-shaking kind of defiance. The white whale tasks me. He heaps me. Yet he is but a mask. Tis the thing behind the mask I chiefly hate. The malignant thing that has plagued and frightened man since time began. The thing that mauls and mutilates our race, not killing us outright, but letting us live on with half a heart and half a lung. God keep us, keep us all. Now Ahab begins to think, hmm, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe there's not beyond, maybe there's nothing beyond um, God, but he, he denies it, he, he wipes it out. He is a person who has to believe in a God so that he can strike it, contain it, control it, overcome it, and become himself a kind of God. Ishmael is, is actually contemplating the fact that there is no God whatsoever, and his problem is how then do you go about your life? How do you organize your life? How do you construct your life? What do you do? As Ishmael struggles to understand the world around him, he senses something profoundly disturbing about the whiteness of the whale. Melville devotes an entire chapter to the meaning of white and why it is so terrifying. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. Though in many natural objects whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, yet for all these accumulated associations with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. Ishmael explores the basis for his own fears in this chapter. He asks himself at the beginning of the whiteness of the whale, what is it about whiteness that is so terrifying to me? What is it about this whiteness of Moby Dick that has been the basis for my joining Ahab's quest? Whiteness for him is not just a representation of death. It's not a representation of innocence or purity. Whiteness for him was, uh, was associated with nothingness, a terrifying, hot nothingness. Or is it that in essence, whiteness is not a much color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time, the concrete of all colors? Is it for these reasons there is such dumb blankness of meaning and wide landscape of snows, a colorless crevasum which rain? And all of these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wander ye then at the fiery hunt? Moby Dick is not just symbolic of one thing as Ahab would make him out to be. He is an all-encompassing symbol of almost everything in the universe. Melville had a premonition that Moby Dick would not be accepted by the American public. In a letter to Hawthorne, he wrote, Dollars damn me. What I feel most moved to write, it will not pay. 
yet altogether write the other way I cannot. So the product is a final hash, and all my books are botches. Though I wrote the Gospels in this century, I should die in the gutter. When Moby Dick was first published in 1851, Melville's fears were confirmed. The book was a failure. It was a failure because so many of the re reviews were written by members of the religious right, the, the fundamentalist Christians who attacked the blasphemy in it. It dared to, to question the theological aspects of, of our everyday existence. It dared to question that whether there was a God or not. It uh, dared to present a character like Ahab who would forthrightly say, I'm um, demonic, I, I, I'm satanic, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out to kill uh, the great God up there and set myself up in some sort of way as that God, you know, a tremendous act of, of pride and, and hubris. That's shocking. All this, the phallic humor and all of this, the, uh, the mincer who peels off the skin of the whale's phallus and drapes it, makes holes in it and drapes it over him. And Mel was not subtle about it. He said it makes, he looked like a candidate for an archbishop prick and he puts the K on the end of the, of the word. So he's, uh, he's, he's really trying to, uh, to shake people up. Moby Dick and Herman Melville disappeared from the American literary landscape for over 70 years. Hollywood rediscovered the book in the 1920s and the 1930s, making two films starring John Barrymore. What uh, Barrymore accomplished was to bring the title of the novel to the attention of the people. Now it's true they did not faithfully portray the novels. In both of them, the whale is killed and uh, Ahab returns to acclaim his lady love. But what happened was, suddenly there were editions of Moby Dick in the bookstores and they would use a John Barrymore scene on the cover. I'm sure many people who saw the film picked the book up and took it home to read and were in for a great surprise when they found inside the real Moby Dick novel. The film adaptations returned Moby Dick to public consciousness. Melville's 19th century novel came alive in the 20th century. Since then, each decade has had new interpretations of Moby Dick. In the 1990s, many people have found an environmental message in the book. And Melville had an enormous respect for nature, for whales and the sea. Melville is actually saying that uh, this capitalistic enterprise called whaling is destroying nature, is, is brutalizing nature, and that the beauty of nature, when let alone, is going to be a symbol enough as it is for the harmony of existence. A lot of these come together in one remarkable scene called the Grand Armada chapter, in which uh, Ishmael and Queequeg, his cannibal friend, are rowing out into a pod of whales that are actually in a kind of a circle. When everything is calm, everything is marvelously at ease. And Ishmael looks, looks over the boat and into the water, and deep down in the water he sees uh, a mother whale giving birth to uh, a calf. And at that instant, in come the other whalers and it becomes this incredibly amazing scene of chaos and blood and gore. All of this gets completely destroyed by the whalers who are out to destroy, to make money, to make cash. The whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now as we, 18 men with our 36 arms and 180 thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert, sluggish corpse in the sea, 
and it seemed hardly to budge at all. Melville's knowledge of the biology of sperm whales was extraordinary. You read Moby Dick now, and you can read it largely for the scientific information it has about whales. He knew the exotic nature of the sperm whale's construction. He knew, for example, that uh, even though he called it the head, he knew that, that the entire forward portion of a sperm whale is its nose. It is the largest nose in the history of the world. Um, a sperm whale can have a nose that's 20 feet long, and the nose portion of a sperm whale is filled with oil. In the nose, there could be a thousand gallons of oil. They would open a, a hole in the, the superstructure of the nose, and they would lower a bucket into it and pull out these buckets of the spermaceti oil. After the spermaceti oil is pulled out of the nose, the long process of stripping off the blubber begins. The blubber was taken off in huge pieces called blanket pieces. They were st stripped off the whale, kind of um, like skin comes off an orange. And these huge blanket pieces were then um, swung over onto the ship and lowered through a big hatch into the lower room, which was called the blubber room. It was kind of smoky, dim, dark light. And they're working with extremely sharp knives. Melville says, toes are scarce amongst veteran blubber room men. When they were boiling the blubber out, rendering it into oil, it, it, it was a horrible smell that just permeated the ship. Melville says that it smelled like the left wing of the Day of Judgment. It was an argument for the pit. They said sometimes you could tell a whale ship five miles away from it at sea because the smell was so bad. One night, while the men are cutting up and boiling down the blubber, Ishmael is standing on deck observing. His mind begins to wander. He has a frightening vision. Ishmael looks at this and thinks he's seeing a, an image of, of hell with demons and devils dancing around it. And at the same time, he, be, he, he recognizes that this uh, fire, which is an artificial kind of fire, basically designed to create an industry, is putting him into a trance in some sort. He's becoming mesmerized by it, and he begins to realize that it's essentially the same kind of fire that's driving Ahab, a fire of obsession. And this obsessiveness begins to take over him as he stares into it, until he kind of wakes up from this state, and he realizes at this point that he can no longer be a follower of Ahab, that he has to sort of separate himself now from Ahab and see a new way of living. One of Ishmael's great lines in the novel is, O oh man, look not too long into the face of the fire. And of course it is Ahab who does look too long into the face of the fire and thus can only see fire. His vision becomes the vision of the inferno and he cannot see life with what Ishmael calls the equal eye. He cannot see the heavens. He does not have a heavenly intuition. Ishmael begins to understand that life is balanced with both sadness and joy. He comes to see himself as what he calls the Catskill Eagle. What you have is an image of flight and of freedom uh, combining the despair of Ahab and the, the freedom and truth of the sun. And Ishmael is that bird, that Berkshire eagle, who can dive down and then come back up. And by diving down, it means he's following Ahab, but by coming back up, he's separating himself from it. Ishmael has found a new equanimity with the universe. But Ahab remains obsessed with the white whale. What is it? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it? What cousining, hidden lord and master and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me that against all natural lovings and longings, I so keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself out all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart I durst not so much as dare. Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? 
Ahab says he has become demonic, madness maddened. He tells the blacksmith to forge him a new harpoon for the white demon. He's ready to fight evil and erase it from the world. baptizes his new weapon. Ego non baptizo te in nomine patris, sed in nomine diaboli. I'm baptizing thee not in the name of the Father, but rather in the name of the devil. And soon after Ahab's harpoon is tempered, a whale is sighted. Two days, Ahab tries to kill his nemesis, but Moby Dick will not die. On the third day, the white whale is so enraged he attacks and sinks the Pequod, killing all the men on board. Ahab and Ishmael watch helplessly from their small boats. Suddenly, Moby Dick turns and surfaces next to Ahab. The harpoon was darted. The stricken whale flew forward. With igniting velocity, the line ran through the groove, ran foul. Ahab stooped to clear it. He did clear it, but the flying turn caught him round the neck and voicelessly as Turkish mutes bowstring their victim, he was shot out of the boat ere the crew knew he was gone. All but Ishmael vanish into the sea. Now small fowls flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf. A sullen white surf beat against its steep sides, then all collapsed. The great shroud of the sea old on is old five thousand years old. Fifteen years after the publication of Moby Dick, Herman Melville had fallen into obscurity. His book had not been understood by the American public. He was unemployed, desperately broke and the father of four children. Melville took a job as a customs inspector at the port of New York for four dollars a day. He continued to be a prolific writer up until he died at the age of 72, writing 15 books, including Billy Budd. But Herman Melville never again received public recognition in his lifetime. So if I had to cast him, he would be a gray man in tatters. He would be a raggedy man. You'd be homeless in the midst of his family, in the midst of, of life. Very melancholy, a terrible, terrible thing, since his roots were going down into the soil instead of being washed clean by the tides. I'd rather not think of that. Didn't really belong anywhere. His life was posthumous. He outlived his reputation. People said that ironically and cruelly. Uh, when they were, were reviewing Moby Dick, but he, he did, he outlived his reputation 40 years. Herman Melville was so forgotten that when he died in 1891, 40 years after the publication of Moby Dick, the New York Times got his name wrong. Today, his masterpiece endures. It's a book that says you're never done experiencing, you're never done knowing. You need the silvery jet just over the horizon to keep us endlessly pursuing um, not fact so much as, as truth. Ishmael is the only survivor of the Pequod. 
He floats alone until he is rescued by the whaling ship, Rachel. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel that in her retracing search after her missing children only found another orphan. Ishmael lives to tell the tale, always questioning, always looking for answers in a seemingly meaningless universe, while the great white whale survives, swimming the vast oceans of the earth.